hello, are we even? No, okay, I'm already losing my voice. So, welcome to another video, another monthly wrap up. Here's the thing about February. I always consider it such a short month, but realistically, it's only two to three days shorter than everyone else. But I just feel like February goes by in the blink of an eye. So I was thinking kind of in the middle of February, I really hadn't read that much. And I was thinking like, man, this monthly wrap up is going to be really short. And then the middle of February happened and I read so much. And so I have a lot to talk about and we are just going to dive right in, shall we? Let me get my notes out. The very first book that I read, which I actually read at the very end of January, is, sorry, <laughs> my laptop's flying, um, is The Memory Police by Yoko Ogawa. And I mentioned it in a previous video that I had started reading it and it gave me a lot of the same vibes as The Giver by Lois Lowry. And if you haven't read The Giver, it takes place in a kind of utopian dystopian society where there have been strict regulations made so that if you're okay to kind of live without questioning and just live how the society is exactly laid out you're fine you live a pretty happy life but there are some people who either question things or have the ability to see the world outside of this weird utopian frame. The Memory Police felt very much like The Giver. That was a horrible summary of what The Giver is, but The Memory Police actually takes place in a town where things just kind of disappear. So for example, coffee. You wake up one day and you're like, mm, something doesn't feel right. And throughout the day you realize that people are throwing out their coffee makers and you need to get rid of any book about coffee, any coffee cups, coffee makers, any coffee beans, coffee trees, stuff like that. Um, all has to be away with, um, put away, right? And there are the memory police who make sure that you don't hold on to anything. And then eventually after you discard the physical things, um, the memory actually does fade from your mind. So people aren't like, oh man, remember when we had to get rid of coffee? They genuinely just don't remember coffee. Like the word, it means nothing to them, so on and so forth. Of course, there are a couple people who do, for some reason, their brains don't work as the memory police would like them to. So they do remember things. And so the memory police kind of whisk them away. And so our main girl is a writer and her father had passed away and her mother was taken by the memory police. Um, and she doesn't, she forgets things as one should. We're basically just following her through this particular time in her life where things start to disappear. And she has a few friends that do remember things. And so she's kind of harboring them. I was really into it for the first three quarters of the book. And then it kind of becomes a little meta <laughs> because as they're forgetting more and more things, not only physical things, but they kind of forget certain emotions. Like they forget to care. They, they forget to give a shit because people aren't sitting around being angry that they're forgetting things. They're forgetting that they're forgetting things. Um, so there's no reason for them to kind of rebel or whatever. So as the book kind of reaches a certain point, our narrator, when in my brain, as the person who does remember all these things, like I'm witnessing her forgetting all this stuff, the reader is like, girl, be pissed, like rise up, do something, run away. But she doesn't because she doesn't think about that. Um, so the ending wasn't really what I wanted it to be because I'm the kind of person that likes resolution and justice and I want the good people to win. But the book just kind of follows the trajectory of the story and it just becomes kind of this less and less and less. And that's how it ends. I enjoyed reading three quarters of it and then I understand why it ended the way that it did and I appreciate the work as a whole. It wasn't like the best read, if that makes sense. I Yeah. That's kind of what it is. I think it's a great work of literature, but as far as like an exciting book to read, if you're the kind of person that likes to have resolution and stuff, not so much, but I would still recommend it, especially if you did like The Giver by Lois Lowry. 
lots of similar vibes. So yes, that was the memory police. Next up, I'm not gonna talk about them because I made an entire separate video about it, but I did read From Blood and Ash and Kingdom of Flesh and Fire by Jennifer Armentrout. I went into this thinking that it was going to be a fantasy. Jennifer Armentrout is in fact a very well-known romance writer which I did not know. This really was a romance with like a fantasy background kind of going on. I said in my video, which you can watch up here, um, I said that I was probably going to read the third one because I thought that this was a trilogy and I just want to know how it ends. I'm that kind of person when it comes to a series. But I was notified in the comments that this is planned to be a six book series and I cannot imagine how she's gonna string this story along. So I'm probably not going to continue the series, the six book series. I'm gonna sit this one out, guys. So that's my review. If you wanna know more about the book and my feelings about it, I have a reading vlog above um, or linked in the description box. So enjoy. Next up, ooh, this one's hard to talk about without spoiling it because it is the final book of a series, but I read A Vow So Bold and Deadly by Bridget Kemmerer. Um, and this is part of the, I think it's called the Curse Breakers series. First book is A Curse So Dark and Lonely. If you want to know about this series, I talk about it in my all the YA books I read in 2020 video, um, which you can find up there. Here's the thing, um, you know, it resolved things. It ended the series. At the end of the day, the main conflict in the series just wasn't strong enough for me. It wasn't believable. And I think she was trying to kind of pull on like themes of dealing with PTSD and stuff like that, but it wasn't super convincing. I wanted to like the characters, but I was getting so pissed because I was like, if you guys literally just sat down and talked, everything would be resolved and we wouldn't have a trilogy. We would have, you know, it could have been a duology. It was whatever. It was a ride that I went on and I didn't hate it. I didn't love it and she tied it all up. I thought the ending was fast. Like the ending happened so fast, um, which it should have if they just talked to each other like 300 pages prior. If you have started the series and you wanna know like if the ending was satisfying, yeah, the ending was satisfying. The ending was quick, but it was satisfying. So, a vow so bold and deadly. Next up, I was considering not talking about this because I actually didn't finish it, but I'm gonna talk about it. Um, I read Dead Wake by Eric Larson, and this got on my radar thanks to Noelle Gallagher, um, and I trust her. And I did like um, A Devil in the White City, which I talk about in my true crime book recommendations up there. I know that I like his writing style. I think that Eric Larson's really good at writing kind of nonfiction, like a more dramatized nonfiction. Um, and what he does, oh wait, what's the book about? <laughs> it's about the sinking of the Lusitania, which is like a huge passenger ship likened to the Titanic, I would say. But instead of it being an accident of nature, iceberg, um, this was actually an act of war. It was shot down by a submarine and I'm really interested in that kind of thing. Actually, I remember, I hope this doesn't taint your image of me, but I was like a super morbid kid. And I remember um, they had all these books that were like diaries of girls going through certain historic moments in time. And there was one where a girl was on the Titanic and I remember skipping, like skimming the book until I got to the part where the Titanic was sinking. <laughs> So this is told in multiple points of view and so we see things through some of the eyes of the passengers or we learn about the passengers. Um, we learn about the captain of the ship, the president at the time, Woodrow Wilson, and the captain of the submarine. I've only read about half of it but he's so good at giving you facts, especially about things that I'm not super interested in like the engineering of like how a submarine works or like how the hierarchy within a submarine works or like the I don't know certain rules of war stuff like that like war etiquette I guess things that I wouldn't normally 
think that I'm interested in. Um, he explains it in a way that I was so drawn in and now I know so much about submarines. I'm so terrified of submarines in general, um, but now I know a lot about them. They're still terrifying. If you're looking for another work of nonfiction that is kind of about history, politics, wartime stuff, um, really interesting. The Dead Wake. Okay, this next one is a little difficult to talk about because I'm still kind of processing my feelings about it. It is Nevernight by Jay Kristoff. I forget what video it was, but Cindy reviewed it and she said the words My Chemical Romance. And I think that she was meaning it to be kind of a negative thing. But literally when people say anything about MCR, the sentence becomes like, my Chemical Romance. I heard MCR, I was like, Pff. putting this on hold. So it finally came in and here's what it's about. So I think the society is supposed to be kind of based off of Rome. I don't know, that's not important at all. But um, basically our main girl, her father was a very high ranking person in the military and we learned that he tried to kind of stage a coup and tried to overthrow the emperor or counselor or whatever he is. As a result, he was killed for treason. He was publicly executed. Then her mother was whisked off to this prison with her baby brother and she was also going to be killed. She wasn't gonna be thrown in jail. They were gonna be nice, you know, and just drown her. And she ends up escaping and finds shelter with this guy who is training her to become a blade. In the society that she was born into, they worship this church of light because um, they live in this place where there are three suns and there's like never night. Mm -hmm. And then there's the opposing church, which is the, they worship the mother and the night, right? She is training to become a blade of the church of night i guess her goal in life is just to become this badass assassin and she's gonna kill all the people who killed her father and ruined her family and so she's been training for like six years to become this super deadly assassin and then she gets sent off for her final task which is to go to this school which essentially kind of narrows you down like america's next top blade and they have to take all these classes and pass all these tests and eventually only four are picked to become this thing that she wants to become. Overall, like it had all the ingredients of things that I'm interested in when it comes to a young adult fantasy. On the surface, like if I just really quickly think about it, it was fine. The thing that bothered me without going into too many specifics, I have something in my eye. How do I explain this without sounding problematic? Hmm. Most of the fantasy specifically fantasy but honestly like every book that i've been reading recently most of the books that i read are written by either female or gender non-conforming authors and i didn't really i don't really think about that too much hopefully when i'm reading i try to forget who the author is right i should just be reading the story so i didn't give much thought to it <clears throat> But this book, something about it, I can't really explain it that well, but I was just hyper aware that this was written by a man. Even though the main character is a teenage girl, it felt like a man writing a teenage girl. If that makes sense. I Again, I can't explain this really well. Even like there were a couple sex scenes, like intimate scenes, even that I was like hyper aware that like, this was really written from a male perspective. And when I, when I read from like a female perspective, I, I don't necessarily think about that. Um, so I don't know, I can't pinpoint to you exactly what it was, but it was just a thing where I couldn't not think about the author. It made it difficult, especially the first half was difficult to get through. Once I kind of just got in the rhythm and like I wanted to know what happened, I was able to or maybe it got better, I don't know, but I was able to read the last half of the book, but getting into it was strangely difficult. Um, but I am gonna try and read the second one just to see if I still feel that kind of ugh-ness because I do think that towards the end, the writing got better. So yeah, that was Never Night. I think, you know, it had all, like I said, all the ingredients, but just the execution of it was we like just strange to me i felt strange reading it and again i couldn't not picture the author 
writing it. I wasn't lost in the book, I was just hearing the male voice tell me this story, if that makes sense. So that's Never Night. I'll let you know if I continue the series and I will update you. So there's that. Oh, okay, next up, back on my thriller BS, I read When No One Is Watching by Alyssa Cole. I read this in like one day. How do I explain this? So first and foremost, just starting off, in the last video I posted, I specifically said that books, I rarely laugh out loud when I'm reading books. This book, wouldn't you know it, had me laughing out loud, which is rough to say because of what my next point will be. But just first and foremost, the author's voice, the way that she wrote kind of the inner monologue of our main character, so funny, so just, she had some one-liners that I could so easily feel our character's voice. I just loved the characters, I did. So that being said, it was funny, but what is this book about? So it takes place in Brooklyn in this specific neighborhood that is filled with historic brownstones, which are these gorgeous houses, absolutely beautiful houses. And it has become a historically black neighborhood. And our main character has just gotten divorced and she moved back to her mom's house, like her childhood home. And she is just getting hounded every day by real estate people trying to buy out her home. And it's gotten even worse lately because this biotech company has been approved to build their like campus, their big office right in that neighborhood so it's gonna become you know the new trendy place everyone's trying to snatch up all these houses and gentrification is like a nice word for it but it's basically like forcefully removing people from their homes it starts out really slowly you know like one day she tries to go to her local bodega and it's not like they suddenly sell kombucha there. So the first half of the book really is us just getting to know her neighborhood, her neighbors, and it seems like every day something else changes. She's constantly worried, like she's trying to go to the beauty shop and she's like, what if it's not there? Like, what if I turn the corner and it's not there? And she's just seeing her world be taken away. And in the course of like a month, um, three families that she's known for the longest time move out, uh, are basically kicked out. And these three, three, four white families move in. The thriller and the suspense and the eeriness really starts about halfway through when we start to see things just aren't adding up. Like we know that people are selling their houses and moving, but the way that they're disappearing, just like things are off and it's, it starts to get a little like eerie. I don't wanna go too much more into it. I really enjoyed all of the characters. One thing I really enjoyed was there are multiple characters who are like well-meaning white people, but they still fuck up. It's kind of hard to be a good white person when you just like kicked a black family out of their home that's been in there, you know? Eh, right? I actually really appreciated reading this book because her character was able to kind of correct and like comment on these actions that like I've probably done some of these things or like my parents have probably done some of these things and like you mean well but like actually think deeply about the actions that you're taking and the things that you're saying and the questions that you're asking and so it was honestly educational to read the way that she kind of hit some of these people over the head with like, what are you actually doing though? I appreciated that part of it. The ending and like how it was resolved, I actually think that Cindy mentioned this in a review. I talk about Cindy way too much. Um, she mentioned that the ending was a little bit fantastical. Like the whole novel, everything is really genuine things that happen. Like I've witnessed it in New York, like you turn the corner one day and the bodega is like a health food store selling kombucha. Like that's just a thing that happened. So it did feel really, really realistic until how it kind of ends. It feels like they took a realistic ending and kind of turned up the volume a little bit. And I feel like it could have been harder hitting if it was less fantastical. I still think that it was a an interesting ending, but it did feel a little, uh, a little much. Um, but overall, I really enjoyed it. Like I said, I think I read it in a day. Um, and yeah, I would definitely recommend if you're looking for a thriller that you haven't read yet, 
when no one is watching. Ooh, next up is one that I had actually a lot of fun with. Um, it was the Inheritance Games by Jennifer Lynn Barnes. And this is definitely a younger young adult book. I would kind of recommend it for maybe um, mature eighth graders to early high school. It was just a lot of fun. It was basically like Knives Out, if you've seen that film, and if you haven't, watch it. But it was kind of like Knives Out for young adults. Um, so basically our main girl is living in Connecticut, I think, and she's just a high schooler doing her thing. Her mom has passed away. Her dad is kind of like a deadbeat dad. She lives with her half-sister. Her half-sister has an abusive boyfriend, so whenever he comes to stay, our main girl chooses to live in her car. Um, so she's just really like scraping by hoping to just get through high school so that she can go to college and she's really interested in um like statistics and she wants to do like risk assessment risk analysis stuff like that she's very she's brilliant so that's her whole plan one day she gets called am i okay one day she gets called to the principal's office and there is a guy waiting there about her age and he's like girl why haven't you answered my letters we've been looking for you we can't read my grandfather's will until you're present and she's like i don't know you i don't know your grandpa i have nothing to do with texas like blah 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 she researches this guy she's like well fine i'll you know i legally have to be there so i'll, I'll go but like i have no idea why i'm going and as she's on the airplane she's researching who the hell this guy is the grandfather is a bazillionaire hella rich. He has four grandsons and two daughters. So the grandsons have just been prepped for life that they're going to inherit his like $46 billion empire and his charity organization, like everything. But <laughs> similar to Knives Out, when they're reading the will, our main girl who doesn't know this family gets all of the money. So she's like a 17 year old and she has $46 million, billion, billion dollars at her disposal. And the only catch is that in order to keep the money, she has to live in the house, this manor for one year. And if she doesn't, she kind of forfeits the money. Obviously it's weird. She's like, well, I'm not gonna say no, but you know, this is strange. I do not know why I have been picked. We soon learn that the grandfather loves puzzles he loves games and so ever since they were little he's like trained his grandsons to do all these scavenger hunts and like there's all these weird keys in the house and like secret passageways and all this stuff they slowly realize that like wait a second this is grandpa's last game and like for some reason this girl is a piece of it and she wants to know too obviously so she's a part of this like scavenger hunt of figuring out what is her connection to this? Why is she getting all of this money, etc.? Obviously, some of the family members are pissed, and so her life is at stake. It's, you know, it's high stakes. I thought it was pretty enjoyable. Like, it was obviously fantastical, like having these mega rich, mega handsome four grandsons walking around. I mean, yeah. There's one character that really likes scones. And the way that he talks, he's like a very straight, he's kind of out there. Um, I enjoyed his banter a lot. So I didn't know how they were going to wrap it up, but there is a twist at the end that makes the sequel make sense. I didn't know how they were going to continue it, um, but I am excited for the sequel and I will definitely be reading it. I think it comes out this summer. So yeah, if you're looking for a like easy read, not really a thriller, but sort of this young adult mystery, lots of like piecing together clues and running through secret passages and stuff like that. Um, the Inheritance Game was a good time and I think it's gonna be made into a TV show. So there it is, there you go. Whew. Okay, uh -huh. we're gonna talk about it. A Court of Silver Flames. I did read it. In fact, I read it in one day. I read for eight hours. Um, which is part of why I'm in a reading slump right now. <laughs> but yeah, how do I talk about this? I might spoil it a little bit, just just a tiny bit. Um, so if you don't want to know anything about this book, skip to this point. Okay, this is the fifth book of the A Court of Thorns and Roses series. Right off the bat, I have an issue because I don't think it should have been number five in this series. I think that it would have been better served to completely separate it and have it 
kind of be a series that runs alongside like a sister series kind of that runs alongside to have it be counted as a fifth book in this series feels a little bit strange because the plot to me was basically there to kind of move Nesta's growth along. I felt like it was a little bit weaker than all the other books as far as like things going on and some people will argue that Aquatar in general the plot is weak <laughs> so um but this one in particular was definitely really hyper focused on Nesta and Cassian um to the point where I felt like the plot was just really convenient in order to make certain things happen with Nesta. So for example, and this is the thing that I think might be a little bit of a spoiler, is that Feyre is pregnant, um, which is why she's not very present in the book. I found that to be super strange because at the end of whatever most recent book, she was very adamant about how she wanted to wait to have kids because she wanted, you know, she was like, 20 years old and she wanted to live her life she just got she has wings man like she wants to like fly around and experience life and she's immortal so she's got plenty of time and so for her to like a year later be pregnant i was kind of like but it was kind it needed to happen for the plot to go the way that sarah j mass wanted it to i just felt like the plot was really just made up in order for nesta to go through her thing that being said if you do like being in that world which i do it was 800 pages of being back in that world and it made me want to start doing breathing exercises and i you know i started doing a lot more uh, calisthenics, I would say. I did some balancing exercises after reading this because a lot of it is just her training and becoming physically strong. It depends on what you wanted from this book, really. So overall, I was fine with it. I think she did mention that this was like her spiciest book ever and she has a tendency to use three words, three specific words um, in all of her intimate scenes that are my least favorite words like the unsexiest words actually four yeah i'm gonna say she uses four of the unsexiest words and those are like her buzzwords of the book like the amount of times that i had to read those words that i hate um really ruined any of the intimate scenes for me because i was just like Ugh. but that's just a personal thing so yeah i would just say my only issue with it was that it didn't really feel like it pushed the Aquatar plot forward it felt like this was honestly just kind of made up in order to give nesta her time which you know it was fine i liked the new characters that were introduced but like if you were reading it and you're a fan you wanted to see some of resand you wanted to see pharaoh you wanted to see more you wanted to see our men or as they're not present as much as i kind of thought that they would be and it makes sense that they aren't but yeah, um, that was just my hot take. I obviously didn't mind it because I read it in one sitting. I would just say if it was marketed more as like a separate thing rather than a continuation of the plot, I would have understood it more, but I was just going into it expecting a little bit more plot and I just kind of got a focus on Nesta kind of thing. So overall, like it was fine. It was fine. Not my fave. I would say. I, uh, that's, that's, that, that, that. And last up, I'm not going to talk about it because I didn't finish it. This is the thing about me. I'm so frustrated. I read the inheritance games in one night. I stayed up until 2 a.m. And then the next day I read A Court of Silver Flames. So in two days I finished two books and my brain died. So I'm kind of on a break <laughs> of reading. I'm just frustrated because I'm able to read an 800 page fantasy book in one day, but I'm struggling to finish a 130 page book. But I understand that different genres take a different amount of time. Um, and so for me to properly enjoy this book, I'm doing it in very, very small doses. But I am working on reading On Earth Were Briefly Gorgeous by Ocean Wong. And I don't know if like the plot is going to change because I'm really only on like page 50. Every single page I have highlighted a phrase at least um, because the way that he describes certain things or like picks up on certain details in life are brand new and unlike I've ever heard them described before, um, which I love. I absolutely love that about writing. So um, yeah, so far it's beautifully written, but it's one that I'm definitely taking my time on. This is like my third time attempting to read this book. Hopefully this time I finish it. But if you want to know like my full review, um, I will let you know hopefully in March when I finish it. But those are all my reads of February. 
like I said, I'm in a little bit of a reading slump because I just kind of read, like in that one week, I just read so much. And so my brain is kind of like, let's stop. <laughs> That's what was going on in my life so far. Um, and let me know what you guys thought about any of those, um, especially like Nevernight and a, and a Court of Silver Flames. Those are the ones that I'm like very not sure about my feelings. Um, so let me know down below. I will see you guys next time. Yeah? Okay. Bye. <laughs>